Greetings, and welcome to SQL Querying Fundamentals with Learn It. My name is Christina Tedesco, and I'll be your instructor for this course. If you're enjoying these videos, please click like and subscribe. If you have any questions you want answered by one of our instructors, please join our offsite community. The link is in the description as well. And as always, if this course has exercise files, you will find them in the video description below. So let's talk about what we'll be covering in this course. We'll start off with an introduction to SQL usage and terminology. We'll be executing a simple query. We'll be performing queries using criteria conditions. We'll be summarizing data with mathematical functions. We'll be organizing query data results. We'll be retrieving data from multiple tables, and we'll be exporting query results. So let's start off with the basics. What is SQL and what can SQL do? SQL stands for Structured Query Language. And in short, what that means is that it can retrieve and manipulate data from a database. Now, SQL is an industry standard since the early 1980s. And although different flavors of SQL exist, the fundamental structure of the statements remain the same across platforms and services. So basically what that means is regardless of what tool or vendor you or your organization may be using, whether it's Microsoft, Oracle, or a different third-party vendor, the basic structure of a statement stays the same. So the information that you learn in this course, you'll be able to take regardless of what platform you're using. Additionally, SQL can do a variety of other actions. First and foremost, it can find data in a database by executing a query. A query is just a statement that generates a result set. Additionally, what it can do is it can insert, update, or delete records from a database table. So not only can we view data, but we can manipulate data by adding to it, removing it, or changing it in the existing database set. SQL can also create objects so we can create a database or a database table, and it can also delete objects. So not only can we work with the data in our database and in our database tables, we can actually manipulate the actual database by adding or removing tables as well. SQL can also create views from tables in your database. A view is basically a window into a table that allows you to customize the display better to present your data more efficiently to your user community. So in short, what that means, as you get more familiar with your database, you'll see that the column headings may not really accurately describe the data, or the columns might not be in the order that you want to present it to your users. And you might want to create some like derived or manipulated values to share additional information than what's in the native table. Creating a view allows you to do this and have your user community view a more efficient result set. SQL can also execute a stored procedure. A stored procedure is a predefined set of SQL statements that allow you to execute a specific task. So basically what that means is SQL databases and data in the databases usually require some ongoing maintenance. And instead of having to execute tasks manually on a repetitive basis to do that maintenance, a stored procedure can be created to automate that execution based on a trigger that you'll define in your database. Last but not least, SQL can also manage permissions in your database objects. For example, tables, views, and procedures. So this allows you to restrict the access that your users and your user groups can have in your database, which is really important to make sure that you're maintaining the integrity of your database. You can make sure the users that are accessing your information only have the level of access that they need. They may just need to read or view information. Some other users may be able to manipulate it by either adding or removing information. So you can make that specifications as well to your users and your groups defined in your database. All right, so that's it. We've covered the basics. We've covered the introduction. We know basically what SQL can do. So let's get into it and let's get learning. So in order to follow along with this course, you are gonna need some flavor or platform of SQL in your environment to follow along with. If you don't have one already set up, I'll guide you through installing SQL Server Express by Microsoft, which is what we'll be using to show the information in this course. So open up your browser and just start typing in SQL Server. When you see the SQL Server Express option show in your list, just click on that. 
and find the link to download SQL Server Express from Microsoft. Just make sure you're downloading it from Microsoft and not some other third-party page that may give you other items you don't want in your environment. So click on that landing page from Microsoft, scroll down to the download section, select your appropriate language and click download. Once the exe file has completed to download, open it up in the indicator. And once it's open, allow it to make changes to that device if you're prompted for it and select basic from the initial express screen. Click accept from the terms and conditions. Make note of the install location in case you need it for future reference and then just click install. When your installation finishes, you'll end up on SQL Server Express Edition landing page. It'll show you some locations of your information, leave everything as default, and click on Install SSMS. Installing SSMS installs a management studio that gives you a graphical interface to access your database information from. So this is much easier to view information from rather than the regular command prompt that you'll get generically. So open up that link in your browser and scroll down to where it says download SSMS. So, and you're gonna download SQL Server Management Studio onto your environment. Same process as before. Once the file finishes downloading, simply click on it and begin the installation. Once setup has completed, click close. From your start menu, select SQL Server Management Studio. The application will open up and you'll be presented with your server name, which is your default machine, and your instance of SQL Express. Simply click connect to get started. When you log into SQL Server, Ensure you are using Windows Authentication. Simply click Connect and your Object Explorer will open. We'll talk through this later on in the sessions. You'll see in here, by default, you have some system databases that have been installed and some other objects as well. Don't worry about those. We'll cover what we need to during this course. Right now, let's talk a little bit more about SQL Fundamentals. In this chapter, we learned how to install SQL Server. In the next chapter, we'll learn about the fundamentals of the SQL language. We'll learn about keywords and the hierarchy structure of language. And then we'll begin to actually write some statements on our own. Greetings all, and welcome back to SQL Querying Fundamentals. In this section, we're gonna talk about SQL keywords or reserved words, which basically tell the system what type of information you're trying to access and how to access it. So in order for SQL to know what you want it to do, it has a set of reserved words that are used as commands that you enter in your statement in a certain order to structure what kind of information you want to retrieve from your database. Now there are a slew of SQL commands or reserved words. And if you just type in SQL command in your browser anywhere, you'll get a laundry list of reserved words or references that SQL is capable of using. Now this is quite an extensive list, but don't get intimidated. The structure for the statements is very simple. And if you click on any one of these, you'll be able to see the specifics on what it's used, why it's used, how it's used, and how to set up your statement to get it to be used. Some sites might also allow you to try it yourself, and we'll go through the simple statements here in this course so that you can understand very clearly and very easily how to access and work this information. So before we actually get into the database and write a statement ourselves, I want to talk about the structure just a little bit more. The two words you're going to be using the most 
are select and from. And basically what these words mean are you're asking the database to select specific columns and then you're telling it where those columns are from. So from what table? So in this example here on the screen, you can see there is a table called student because that's where the data is being selected from. And the statement is asking to pick up the student ID, first name and last name column. Now there's some extra information over here towards the end. And what's happening here is they're taking two columns and they're putting that information together to make a full name. We'll talk about that later in this course. Right now, I just wanna concentrate on what you're going to get from a select clause in a statement and from the from clause. So in its most basic form, a select and from statement in SQL will generate a result set. So for example, this result set in this statement will generate this information. I've gotten the student ID, the first name, the last name, and they've manipulated the first name and last name to get full name here in the end column. So here's my result set from the student table. The next statement I wanna talk about is create table. So like we talked about in the introduction, not only can SQL retrieve data, but you can manipulate database objects. So this very simple statement will create a table for you in your database. And the structure below shows the table name you're going to give that follows the create table statement. And then in between the parentheses here, you're going to outline the specific columns and the data types that you want in your table. Don't worry, we'll cover data types and columns specifications later in this course. The last simple clause I want to talk about is the WHERE clause. So the WHERE clause filters your data to be a limited result set. So for example, if you didn't want all the employees in the employee table, you only wanted employees with a specific last name or who are in a specific department, you can use the WHERE clause to identify that filter criteria. An example of that would be something like this where you're asking SQL for the student ID, the full name, the SAT score, when the record was updated from the student table, but you're saying, I don't want everything. All I want is the student IDs between one and five or student ID eight. And I also wanna make sure that the SAT scores do not include 1000 or 1400. And we'll talk through these specifics in the course so you can understand what all of these additional details mean. But this statement filters the results just to be student IDs that are between one and five or eight. And we can see that here. I have one, two, three, four, five, and number eight. And I also have SAT scores that do not include 1000 or 1400. And you can see that here in the SAT score column. So the WHERE clause filters your result set from the columns and the table that you're asking the data from. We'll show you how to do that in this course, and we'll walk through all these specifics to make sure you're only getting the data that you need. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to SQL Querying Fundamentals with LearnIt. Okay, in this chapter, we're going to actually connect to a database through SQL Server and begin the process of writing qu queries. So first thing we wanna do is connect to a database. Now, if you're following along with me and you're using SQL Server Management Studio, we're gonna walk through here how to connect to a database through SQL Server Management Studio to see your information. If you're not using Management Studio, that's fine. You can follow along with the examples on how we create our statements in this course with the database setup that you have in your environment. Now, if you want to set up a database here with me in SQL Server, continue through this chapter. If you're not going to be doing that through SQL Server, you can skip this chapter and go on to the next one where we actually begin to look at a select statement. So I'm going to open up SQL Server Management Studio application from my Windows Start menu. And when I do that, I'm presented with the opening dialog box. Now, all I need to do here is just click Connect. Now, what's going to happen is actually... SQL Server is going to connect you automatically to the databases that were installed when you installed this application. 
Now, theoretically, we could use these for this course, but we don't want to do that because this information is information that pertains to the actual application itself, and it houses a lot of detail that's used for system management and troubleshooting. So we really want to make sure that we leave these alone. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually create our own database, and that's very simple to do. Microsoft supplies a sample database to use with their management studio. And we're going to create that sample database in this environment to use in this course. Now to begin that process, all we need to do is go here towards the top and select the new query button. You'll see a few icons here and features that pertain to creating and modifying SQL queries. And we'll talk through some of these. All we really need to focus on right now is the new query button, which is basically going to open up a query editor in our screen. A query editor is basically a text editor that is used to create and modify queries to alter the result set that you want for your queries as you're working through your database management process. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to paste the contents of a file here that's already been created for us. So we can simply execute that and create our database. Now, in the assets for this chapter, you'll see a file called Northwind SQL. What you want to do is click on that file and download it to your PC and then open it up in a text editor. So if we just open up this file, we're going to see a whole bunch of content in here that looks pretty funky, right? There's a lot going on here. We're going to talk through this at a high level, but it's extremely simple to make this information in here turn into an actual database. So first things first, we got to get the content of this file into the management studio, right? All right, easy peasy. All we're, all we're going to do is have our cursor up at the very top. We're going to click Control A to highlight the entire contents of the file. We're going to click Control C to make sure we copy the contents of this file on our clipboard. We're going to move out of the editor. We're going to go back into Management Studio. We're going to put our cursor at the very top of the SQL editor window that we have, and we're going to click Control V. That's going to paste the entire contents of the file into our SQL editor. So then we're going to go back up to the top of the file. I just clicked control home to make that happen. And I'm going to quickly walk through this information at a very high level so that you can get a basic understanding as to what's going on here. So up here in the top, what's going on is some variable type information is being declared and set up to create the infrastructure for your database. So much of this is really beyond the scope of this course. So we're not going to talk too much with that. We're going to scroll down the file a little bit until we get to some sections that may look a little more familiar. So as we get more towards the middle of the file, you're going to start to see some statements that look rather familiar. It's what we talked about in the beginning of the course. First one being create table. We talked about that, right? We said all we have to do is have these two simple keywords on here. In this example, the employees table is being created. Here's all the columns that are being created in that employees table. And you see some extra information in here next to the column names. We'll talk about these during the course. Basically what they revolve around are the data types for that column, how long or how many characters um, a value can be in that column, and if there's a value can be null or not null. And we will talk about nulls later in this course as well. So scrolling down through the file, you'll see some more actions going on. Indexes is something that helps with performance. You'll see more tables being created. You will be able to get a basic structure or a basic idea on how this database is going to end up looking once this script executes. So I'm just going to keep scrolling down here. This is a very large file. Later on through the file, you'll see the section where views are created. We talked about views. Remember, views are the windows into the table. So you'll see how those are being created. And we'll look at those through this course as well. And then farther down, we get to the actual insert statements. The insert statements are the statements that actually load data into the tables. So you can here see what type of data and kind of data and actual values that are being loaded into the individual tables. 
So keep scrolling down. This is a lot of information, but as you see, it's really the same thing over and over again with value specifics. So going towards the end of the file, we've got a basic idea on what's going on here and how it's being created. All we wanna do now is execute this file to create our database. So to make that happen, we're simply gonna make sure our cursor is at the very top of our file. And all we're gonna do is click this execute button over here in the menu bar on the management studio. Now you can click the execute button or with Microsoft, you can use the keyboard shortcut key F5. If you have a different database tool that you're using in your environment, there may be a different shortcut key or a different button reference that is used to execute queries, but the concept is the same. No matter what tool you're using, it's just the push of a button or the push of a keystroke to, exe to execute a query once it's created. So let's do that. Let's click execute and create this database. So what's gonna happen here in Management Studio is you're gonna see a messages window pop up at the bottom of the text editor, and it gives you a status as to what's going on when you're running your script. Now, some scripts are very complex and they may take some time to run depending on what you're asking it to do. As you can see, this script completed fairly quickly. I can see here that everything's already completed successfully. That statement tells me that everything's complete and it tells me the time that it completed. So this is great. I know now that everything happened behind the scenes the way that it was supposed to happen. Now, if you receive some error messages, you wanna take those error messages and look through your browser to see if you can get any troubleshooting tips on how to handle those. There may be some specific environment issues that you have set that prevent the script from running. Microsoft has a lot of information on error messages that tends to resolve most of the issues. Research those if you need to. I would start with deleting the script, recopying it in here, and trying once again before you began troubleshooting. Once you resolve those error messages, if you're having any, come back in here. We're gonna get into our database and we're gonna to start to execute some queries. So in order to see our new database, once this is completed successfully, all we have to do is close out of Management Studio and log back in. So let's do that now. If you didn't do that with me during this course, pause this video, Execute your script, load it in, run it, log back in, and when you log back in, you're going to see your Northwind database on the left-hand side in the databases list. In this chapter, we learned how to connect to a SQL database so that you can run SQL statements. In the next chapter, we will actually learn how to create and save SQL queries. Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to SQL Querying Fundamentals. All right, if you're following along with me in SQL Server Management Studio, we have now created our very first database. And look at that, there it is, Northwind over here on the left-hand side. If I click on the plus button over there to expand it, I see a slew of information. So let's talk about this a little bit so that you know exactly what you're looking at. So there's a lot of things that are going on in a database. We have diagrams, we have tables, we have views, we have resources, we have a whole bunch of stuff here. Don't worry about anything besides the tables folder underneath the database. That's the only area that we're gonna be concentrating on in this course. Now, if I expand tables, I see here all the tables that that big old ugly script created that we ran in the last chapter. So look what happened here, a lot happened. I have a bunch of tables here. If I expand views, remember we saw those views that were being created. Here's where all those are. So that happened, that's fantastic. And if I look in my tables, I'll see the actual data that was loaded into them. Now, if I wanna see more information before I actually look at the data in my tables, I can by continuing to expand on the left-hand side through the tree options until I get to the columns and I see the actual column detail. So we talked about this information a little bit when we were running through the script. And this is the same information, it just shows you more specifically where it's applied. So I have all my column names here, I have last name, first name, title, and everything here that really pertains to an employee for an, an organization. This funky word here is called the data type. And again, uh, the field values in here can reach up to 20 characters. And it says not null. Now what that means is that this 
column is required for a data value. And that happens a lot in databases because we need some specifics in data to be able to find everything that we need to find. So in this example, what this means in short is that every record in the employee table will have a last name value that's absolutely required. If you tried to load some data to this table that didn't have a last name, it would error out. On the flip side, a title is not required for the employees table. So you could load an employee to the table without a title and the load would run successfully. We'll go through that later in this course as well. Right now, all we're gonna do is start to look at some data in this table so that you can see what a query actually looks like. We're gonna change a query, we're gonna save a query, and we're gonna re-execute a query. All right, you ready? Let's get to it. Okay, so I'm gonna stay here in the employees table. I think this is a really good one to use as an example. I'm gonna right click on it if I'm in SQL Server Management Studio, and I'll also show you how to just create the statement itself specifically in the editor. But since this tool that I'm using has some handy dandy shortcuts, I'm gonna take advantage of those. So when I right click on the employee table, I see a whole bunch of options here in my menu. Okay, great. So what do I wanna do? I wanna just select the top 1000 rows. And basically what that means is I'm just getting the first 1000 records in a table. Tables can get very, 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 very large. They're not in our sample database as you'll see in a second, but in a real environment, the rows in a table can really be quite expansive. So the top 1000 just really gives the user the context of what's in the table, and it really helps with performance when you're trying to generate results. Since database structures can be manipulated extensively, performance can really be an issue in some databases. So limiting your row set to a certain amount really helps you retrieve information faster as you're searching through larger databases as well. All right, so let's do that. Let's click on that. All right, boom. So look what we have here. We have a whole bunch of stuff. I have now the top 1,000 rows in my employees table. And you know what? That's plenty because all I have in here are nine rows. That's fine. Okay, no problem. So you know what would happen if I took out this top 1,000 here and I just said select, and I'm going to do that here to show you what's going to happen. And I have my full column list here and I ran it, I'm gonna get exactly the same results, right? Because this table is so small, it's no problem. I have full nine records. I really don't need to limit my results set here. Okay, now if you don't have a tool where you have a shortcut over there that allows you to generate a number of rows uh, based on a shortcut command from the table, that's no problem. You can write your own specific SQL statement. And we'll talk through that now. It'll be fairly quick. You can see here how basic this is. All I have here is my select clause and my from clause and my list of columns that are enclosed in brackets and separated by commas. That's it. Now, again, if you're using a different tool besides the management studio for SQL Server, your syntax may be a little bit different. And this is what I was referring to in the beginning of the course. Maybe your column names don't need brackets around them. They are going to need a comma. That's fairly standard. But the brackets could be optional. They could be curly brackets. They could be no special characters at all. Just the column name is fine. So research that and make sure you know the specific syntax that you need to generate your statement. And then it's simply a matter of listing your columns in between your select and from statements to get the ones that you want. So in this example, if I wanted to write the statement by hand, I can certainly do that. All I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new query window and I'm going to kind of pull it out so I can compare these side to side to make it easier for me to type. And I'm just going to type in select and I want employee ID. And I'm going to put in a comma and I want last name and I'm going to put in a comma and I want first name. I'm only going to pick three columns because I'm obviously a very slow typer. So you can select and you can add as many columns as you would like to. What you can see is happening here and 
what most likely happens in your tool as well is you get some helper values coming in depending on how your system is set up. So sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. That's all right. If they're giving you what you need, use it. If not, there are options to turn it off. Okay, so all I want here is employee ID, last name, and first name. I'm just going to choose that for my basic select statement. And then I do need to say here, okay, well, where am I getting this information from, right? So I would have to type out Northwind DBO employees. I'm going to cheat, and I'm just going to copy that statement, and I'm going to paste it in here so that you guys don't have to sit there and watch me type, okay? And I'm going to pop this window right back in here, and I'm just going to click Execute. And if I did that right, which I didn't do, I would get a result set. Now I have a syntax error and I do, I know exactly what it is. I can see it, but this is what an error message would look like. And as you get very familiar with these, you'll know exactly how to fix these. So it's telling me that I have a error near line one, which means that's right up top. Here's your lines, one, two, three, four, and five. And here's my error. I've got a curly bracket here instead of a square bracket. So I'm just gonna fix that. And look, there's my field value that I'm looking for. So I'm gonna click on that just to make sure I have the right thing. I'm gonna cl click execute again. And there it is, there are my values. I have employee ID, last name and first name. That's all that I need. I don't need all these other columns. Simultaneously, I could have just highlighted what I didn't need here deleted all of these, make sure I got rid of my last comma so that nothing else is expected to occur after that, clicked execute and gotten my truncated column set. Okay. So pretty easy to generate a statement and get some results. That was fairly quick, right? Right. So let's save this, do some more work, get some more information and go a little farther. To save it is extremely simple. If you right click, you can most likely save in the right hand menu that comes up or just like any application under the file menu, you can save as or save all. I'm just going to save this file, which is titled SQL Query 4 as something more specific. I think I'm okay with this location. I'm gonna call it employees one. And I'm gonna click save. My name saved and my file is saved, which means I can just re-execute that saved file in here at any time. Okay, so if you didn't do those steps with me here, pause this video, follow along, open up the employees table, modify the column set so that you only have a few in your set. Let's start with employee ID, last name and first name, then come back here and let's modify this a little bit more. In this chapter, we learned how to create and save a simple SQL query. In our next chapter, we'll learn how to add conditions to expand your result set. Hey everyone, welcome back. All right, let's pick up where we left off. So first off, let's open the file that we saved. So if you're in the management studio, underneath the file menu, click on open, select file. It should take you to the same location where you saved your file. Just click on it and say open, and we pick up exactly where we left off. So let's talk about this a little bit more. Now that you understand syntax and how things are structured in different tools, you'll also notice that you're able to take some liberties and some shortcuts. So for example, we saw how we can just do a right click on our table and get the first 1000 rows that show the list of all the columns in the table that we're looking for data on. You'll find that what you can also do is in the column view on the left hand side, which most SQL editor interface tools have, you can simply just drag and drop the columns that you're looking for over here on the right. And it's going to preset the syntax for you so that you don't have to worry about it. You do need to make sure you enter the commas that separate the field values so that it knows where to put the information in the right spot, but you can take many shortcut liberties to make it easier to generate your column set. Now that being said also, you'll also see that you can order these in however you want. They don't have to be obviously in the order that the columns are in from the table. So you can structure the order of those columns to be however you would like. 
Additionally, you can more than likely take some shortcuts with the syntax as well, because it can get real tedious to type in brackets and dots and DBOs and all that stuff like that. You'll find that if you just type in the column names with most editors, it will take it even though you may not be using the formal syntax. So for example, if I just typed in last name and then first name, and then city. And I made sure I remembered my commas because I know I need those. And I just said from employees, you see the helper text coming in on the bottom. And even if you didn't select that specific value, just what you type in here just like that will more than likely still generate you the result set that you're looking for. Now, it is really important to understand the syntax in your tool because you may need that in more complex queries. However, for the most part, you should be able to take some shortcuts and not have to put in those tedious characters on an ongoing basis. All right, so let's move on. All right, so I have the columns that I need here in this data result set, but I want to kind of filter my criteria a little bit more. Now, another thing that I can do before I even get into filtering is make sure that I have all of my columns, even if I can't see what they all may be. And what I mean by that is maybe you don't have this tool, right? Maybe you don't have uh, an explorer over here where I can see what all the columns are that I can pick from. And I have no idea what columns are in this table. Someone just told me to get them a certain set of employees from the table in the database. Well, how do I figure out what's in there? If you use just the asterisk wildcard character in SQL, that tells SQL, give me all the columns that are available in this table. So you don't need to know ahead of time what your options are. You can go see what those are, even if you're just flying blind. So if I just simply type in here, select all, which is what this means, select all from employees, and I clicked execute, by default, I'm going to get all the columns in the employee table in their standard order, even if you don't know any of that information on what's supposed to be in there, you can use that wildcard character to generate everything. Then you have a reference point on what the columns are and what your options are and continue to filter your criteria from there. Okay, so that's pretty simple, right? Let's get into just some simple filtering options. So I wanna pick a specific set of columns. I want last name. I want first name, I want address, I want city, I want region, and I want country, and I want postal code. All right, I'm cool with that. Now, I always have to enter my commas, which you will get very familiar in doing. Always make sure you leave off the last one because that's your last column in your list. I'm going to click execute just to make sure I get my results set. I do. That's fantastic. All right. But let's say I don't want all the employees in the employee table, right? Because in the real world, this is going to be fairly large depending on your organization. All I want to see are the employees who live in the USA. So I only want to see the employees that have the country USA is a very simple statement for that is to just execute a select statement that includes a where clause. All right. We talked about this in the introduction, right? So all we have to do is type in where after your table reference and tell the query specifically what your filter criteria is. And in this example, it's going to be where country equals USA because I only want to see my USA employees. So I can type out country equals USA, but because I am so much smarter now, I'm going to use my little shortcuts and I'm going to say where country equals, and I do have to type out USA here because that's a field value. So I'll type out USA. Now, when you're using a field value as filter criteria, you need to make sure you enclose that in quotes. So for SQL Server, I know it's just a single quote that I have to put before and after my field value name so that it knows I'm asking it to look through, look for a specific value in a column. 
All right, so I think I'm set. I have last name, first name, address, city, region, country, postal code from the employees where country equals USA. All right, let's see if that works. So my standard result set shows nine rows here, right? I've got employees from USA and I have employees from UK. All right, so I don't wanna see my UK employees. I just wanna see my USA employees. Let's see what happens. I click execute and there it is, all right? I filtered out my UK employees. My results set now shows my filtered list of only employees who reside in the US. All right, so let's save this query because we're gonna modify it for later use. And we're gonna save employee one SQL as, and let's call this employees one USA. Okay, we're gonna save. And then we're gonna come back here and we're going to get more complex with our filter criteria. So you can see a wider range of options that you have to generate a result set. In this chapter, we learned how to filter our results using a condition. Next, we're going to expand this even farther using and and or operators to expand your result set even more. Hey everyone, and welcome back. All right, let's pick up where we left off once again. So we have our simple statement here that we filtered for just employees that are in USA, right? So we got this result set, we're happy with this. But let's say we wanna filter a little bit more. So not only do we want employees that are in the USA, but we want employees that are just in the city of Seattle, let's say, okay? So what we can do is we can add an additional clause to our where clause to set another criteria to generate an even more detailed result. And here's how we're gonna do that. So I'm gonna pick up where I am in my current statement. And after I have where my country equals USA, I'm gonna say and, because I'm adding something else that I wanna make sure that it filters on. And I'm going to add city equals Seattle. All right, so I'm okay with typing that out. I'm gonna type out city equals and then Seattle. Now I can also cheat here again. I know we're pretty we're pretty good on cheating because it's easy. So if I click in my cell here and I do control C to copy and I click up here and I click control V to paste, you can easily paste a value if the value is extensive or it might be something more than just regular text characters. It could be a URL or some kind of coded reference that's very difficult to type out. Copy and pasting from a result set into your select criteria is absolutely acceptable as well. All right, so not only do I have USA filtered out, but I also just wanna make sure it's got the city of Seattle. I click execute and there it is, okay? So now I've gone even further in my filtered set and I just have employees who reside in, in Seattle, Washington, USA. Now, in addition to the and clause, we can also use the or clause, all right? So the or clause will give you one or the other. So for example, if we went back to just USA and we changed our filter set here, and I said, I just wanna see employees that, I'm looking for two specific employees, and all I know about them is that one of them has the last name Devalio and the other one has the first name Janet. That's just all that I know. So the way that I would do that is I would say, show me all the employees where last name equals Devalio or first name equals Janet, okay? I know that kind of sounds like a weird example, but I just wanna show you what the options are with the current filter set that we have so that you can see how it works here. And then if we execute that, I'm gonna see two employees. One of them has a first name Janet, or the other one has a last name, Devalio. Now, likewise, if I made this be and, obviously that would not work because Janet's last name is not Devalio and Devalio's first name is Nancy. So if I made that or say and, and I ran this, I wouldn't get any results. 
And it would look like that person did not exist. And it's right, they don't exist because it's one or the other, not both. All right. So this is an example where you can use an or clause to search for more than one set of criteria to get either one specification or the other. Okay, so now I think it's time for you to try something on your own. So in the exercise for this chapter, I want you to find an OR criteria from the employees table. So click on the exercise file, follow along. What it's going to ask you to do is find the employees that reside in the country USA or the city of London. All right. So follow on those steps. Use the exercise reference if you need to. Generate your result set. Let's look at it when we come back here and move on to some more complex criteria options. Find the employees where the country equals USA or the last name equals Buchanan. So use the exercise reference if you need to, save your SQL query, and we'll look at it when you come back. Hey everyone, welcome back. All right, let's take a look at the result set for exercise six. So the ask was to create filter criteria for the country of USA or last name Buchanan. So if you added country equals USA or last name Buchanan to your where clause, you should have generated the result set that's showing below, which shows all the employees in the country of USA, with the exception of Stephen Buchanan, who resides in London, UK. All right. Now, if your select query looks different as far as maybe having different columns here, that's fine. That wasn't specified in the exercise. The point to it was just to make sure that you had USA for the country and last name as Buchanan. In this exercise, we looked at two operators to expand our result set. We used and, we used or. In the next exercise, we'll look at values that are null and values that are not null. All right, thank you very much, and let's keep learning. Hey, everyone. Okay, let's move on to null or not null. So these filter criteria are fairly powerful, and you'll find yourselves using them a lot in your SQL query exercises. Basically what this does is this says, make sure I get result sets that only have a value or do not have a value in a location. So for example, if you're looking for records with a null clause in a column, you're only going to get back the results for those records that do not have a value where you're saying. If you use not null, that's just the opposite. You're only going to ask the database to give you results where that column value is populated. Now to show you what that means, we're going to go into the orders table. Okay. So if you want to follow along with me over on the left-hand side, right click on orders, select your top 1000 rows, and we can actually do this together. So what we're going to use here for our column to pick our results from is going to be the ship region column. So what I'm going to do is just pull ship region over here from the left and I'm going to start off with null. So what I'm going to ask is just for all the records where ship region is null or if ship region does not have a value. That's what null means. Null is the default information that SQL puts in to a cell that does not have a value loaded into it. So I'm going to say select my columns from orders where I need that where clause, right? Where ship region is null. All right. So that's the full syntax for the statement. You have to say is null and then I'm going to execute it. And you'll see here in your results, I only have records where there is no ship region value populated. Now, likewise, it's very simple in reverse. If I put a not in here, I'm only going to get values where ship region is populated. I execute that. I see is not null. Every record in this result set has a ship region. All right. So null and not null, very simple to use. You can just play with this on your own. It's extremely simple, but extremely powerful. And you'll find yourselves using this a lot. 
In this exercise, we looked at null and not null conditions. In our next exercise, we'll look at searching for a range of values resulting in a data set that is between a start and an end condition. Hey everyone, welcome back. All right, let's move on to some more different types of filtering clauses so you can see what even more of your options are. All right, we're gonna talk about two clauses here using this table. We're gonna switch over to the products table, okay? So if you wanna follow along while I'm talking through the criteria, over on the left-hand side, you're gonna go down until you find your products table, and then same thing, you're just gonna right-click on that. You can say, select the top 1,000 rows, make it easy. There's not a lot of columns in here, so you can see exactly what it is that is in this table. Okay, so before we move on, I wanna share with you one more little tidbit. If you're looking up here at the top of the file, you see how this criteria is in green and that's just the color that they use for the specific editor. But basically what it means is that the information up here is commented out. So that means that if you use special characters before or after your text that you type in here, it will just be a comment and it won't do anything. So in this example, SQL Management Studio knows that anything in between these special characters is just a comment, it's just text, it's nothing it has to take an action on. So for example, if you just wanted to type in a one line comment, like here I have with between and in, all you would need to do is just type in two dashes and then everything that's typed in after that dash SQL Server knows not to do anything with, they're just words that are on the page. Now, if I took out those two dashes, it would think it's some type of command. I would get an error message if I tried to execute this because it has no clue what this means, obviously, right? So just for um, some extra information here, if it's one line, you only need to have two dashes. If you want a block of text to be a comment, which is not uncommon, when you're writing very complex SQL statements, you wanna explain what it is that you're writing. Some of these statements can get very, very long. And if someone else comes in to look at it to make some modifications, it's extremely helpful to have some comments up top to communicate in layman's terms what the query is doing, all right? So just some information for you there. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna look at two clauses. Uh, one is called between and the other one is called in, okay? So from our products table, let's get a result set here. Okay, here we go. From our products table, we're going to filter this a few ways. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna use the between clause. And what you can do here is you can say, just give me a range of values, all right? So for example, let's say we only wanted to look for the products that have a unit price between 18 and 22. All right, that's all that I wanna look at. I wanna see what my product set is on that price point. So I really don't need to know about anything else that's in here. So very simply, how we would execute that would be from the column criteria selected in your select statement. Again, we're always gonna use a where clause. We're always gonna need that where clause, all right? So the where clause is always the start before you add on any additional filter criteria. So I'm gonna say where, and I'm gonna say unit price. And then I'm going to use my between keyword and I'm gonna say 18. And I'm just gonna copy and paste. And I'm gonna use my and keyword because I have two sets, I have a start and an end, right? I want information that's between two numbers. So I'm gonna use my and clause to make sure it has to look at both the lowest and the highest value. And I'm gonna say 22, right? Now, like we talked before, if it's a data value, I gotta put those single quotes on there, right? So it knows what I'm asking it to look for. All right, so let me see what I have here. Select my columns from products for a unit price between 18 and 22. All right, let's see if this works. Now, when I execute this, I should only see products that have a unit price of 18, 19, 20, 21, or 22. And there we go. All right, so let's check this out, see if we got it right. All right, so I have 18, 19, 22, yep, 21, 35, yep, that's in the middle. All right, scrolling down, okay, this looks good. 
So this gave me everything in that range of values. So between is a very powerful clause where you can select ranges of values between two numerical values in a column. Now, the next option that we have is called the in clause. All right. So if you wanted to pick more than one value in a column, you can use in to list multiples to look for. And what that means is we're going to say, give me all the products where my supplier ID is either one, five, or two. All right, one, two, or five. We'll look for those. So instead of saying supplier equals one or supplier equals two or suppliers equals five, that's a lot, right? We can make this a lot easier. So let's say we take off all the between information. We don't need that anymore. And we're going to say in. It's going to be our filter clause and we're going to pick our column and it's going to be supplier ID. And I'm going to use my little helper here. And I'm going to say in and then I have to do an open parentheses. So I kind of have to type this information in a list. OK, and the list has to be included in parentheses and they need to be separated like in commas, just like the column names do up here in your select statement. So I'm going to say in one, two and five. And then I'm going to close my parentheses. All right. So this looks good. Products where supplier IDs include one, two, or five. This looks good. Let's execute. And there we have it. Okay. So instead of having to say, or over and over again from the same field or from a different field, I can pick multiple criteria from a same column to show more than just one value in a result set. Okay. So for our exercises using the between and in clause, here are the two select statements that you're going to create. The first one is going to be where your category ID includes two, three, and five. And your second SQL select statement is going to be where your reorder level is between zero and five. Okay. So, Pause this video, generate those SQL statements, come back here, and we'll look at your results. All right, let's look at your results sets and see how you did. All right, so reviewing the results for between and in, let's start with the in clause for the category ID. So if you said where category ID in 2, 3, 5, that should generate your result set filtering out your information to just be category IDs two, three, and five. Now for the between clause, we looked at the reorder level column and we just wanted rows that have a reorder level between zero and five. So if you entered where reorder level between zero and five and executed that result set, you should see just rows with an e a reorder level of between zero and five. All right. So if your statements came out a little different than these did, copy these statements from the exercise files in this chapter, compare them to what you have, make your changes, and then we'll move forward. In this exercise, we learned how to search for a range of values using the between operator. In our next exercise, we'll look at using wildcard characters to find data you might not know all the detail of. Hey everyone, welcome back once again. All right, in this lesson, we're going to talk about wildcard characters. Now, what wildcard characters allow you to do is find information that you might not know the full field value that you're looking for. So for example, if you didn't know the full address of an employee, or you didn't know the employee's full name, or you didn't know every piece of information that you needed to get your specified result set, you can use a wildcard character to just start there and get uh, results that are like that, not exactly like that, where you can filter through and find what you need. So a wildcard character in SQL is a percent sign. Okay. That's what's used as wildcard characters. And when you use a percent sign in your where clause for your filter criteria, the system knows to look for anything before or after what's in between those percent signs. So let me show you some examples. So it becomes a little more clear. 
Let's look at the orders table again. Okay, so we'll just start off with all of the rows in the orders table. So I see everything on here, but I don't want all this. I only want some specific customers. Now, I don't know the whole customer ID. I don't have that information for whatever reason, but I do know that the customer ID um, starts with the letters VIN. Okay, let's keep this simple and just try to get this first record up here. So if that's all that I knew, all that I would need to execute here is after my where clause, I'm gonna reference my column that I want to put my filter criteria on. And I'm gonna use the word like, okay? So the word like tells the system, I'm looking for something that sort of matches this, but not exactly. So I type in like, and then I enter what I know about the result set that I'm looking for. And in this case, all I know is that the first three letters of my customer ID are VIN. Okay, let's use that for an example. So I'll go VIN, and I don't know what the rest of the ID is. So all I'm gonna do is put a percent sign after the N, and then close it out with my quotes, and see what I get back. What I should get back is just customers that start with VIN, all right? So let's kick this off and see what happens. There it is. I only got customer IDs V-I-N-E-T because that's the only ID that matches this criteria. Now let's say you didn't even know that much. Let's say you only knew that the customer ID had the letters I and N in it. No problem. If you had a percent sign before and after the IN, what you're telling the system to do is to give me everything that just has the letters I, N, somewhere in the ID. And it's gonna return to you all the customer IDs with information before or after the letters I and N. Okay, so now you see you have a lot more information. And if you scroll through this, it makes sense. There's I N, I N, I N, I N, I N. So you can see how it's really powerful to enter a wildcard character either after or before or in both places to start to filter what you need so you can find exactly what you're looking for if you don't know beforehand. Okay, so why don't you try this on your own? Why don't you try to find in the orders table only the orders that have the ship name that include the letters IN, all right? We're gonna do that. See if you can create that statement, generate your results with just those ship names. We'll take a look at it, see how you did, and take it from there. Okay, let's look at your results for your wildcard character testing and see how you made out. All right, so let's start off with all the records in the orders table just to get the original results that we're going to be filtering from. So if you look through here and you can see on the left-hand side, no matter what type of tool you're using, you'll usually be able to see your row count over here on the left to get an idea on how much is being filtered and that your result set is filtered, again, if you end up with a very large data set. So what we asked you to do is to just give a result set from the orders table where the ship name includes the letters I and N. All right, so we made it fairly simple, just really basically changing the column name from the example that was in the lesson. And if I do that and I execute this, I get results that are filtered from the original. And I know that just by looking at, first of all, the count of rows, I know this is less than it was initially, so that's great. Now, if I look through the ship names, this looks a little weird when you first look at it. It, it kind of looks like, well, wait a second, that didn't really work because we're so used to kind of just looking at this IN here or where it was just very specific in the shorter value in the customer ID column. But if you look through this, it's right. If you look through this, through all these results, at some point on here, there is an I and an N together in every one of these results, and that is why they all came back in this example. So this was actually something really good to look at because you can see how the more detailed you get in your work clause, obviously the better information that you're gonna get. 
And SQL is very detailed where you want to make sure you're reviewing all of your field values and all your columns to make sure you're getting exactly what it is that you're looking for. So this was a good example because it looks like you have much more here than you're expecting. But again, if you read through this, everywhere on every single one of these rows, the letters I and N are together somewhere in the ship name. All right. All right. So excellent job for getting through this lesson. Let's move on. In this exercise, we learned how to use wildcard characters to find data that you might not know all the specifics of. In our next exercise, we'll start to look at formatting, beginning with creating aliases for column headings. Okay, now that we've talked about filtering data and making sure you get the results set that you need, let's talk about formatting information a little bit better so it looks better in your results set when you either create your exports or share your views with your client base. So as you get more familiar with your database tables and your columns, you're going to see that the column names are really generic in how they're titled. And they're titled a certain way for a certain reason. It just makes it much easier to enter information that you're searching for where you don't have any spaces and the titles are fairly concise so that there's not a lot of typing and editing to do when you're looking for information. Now that's great for when you're doing queries and you're looking for data, but when you're trying to generate a result set that you will more than likely export to a file and share with business users in your community, those titles really don't look very good and they may be misleading in some cases. So what you are able to do is make something called column aliases. And what this will do is you can reset the title of your column and save that in your SQL file. So every time you generate it, your export will come out with a different column name that might be more user friendly to your user community. So let's show that in a few examples here. So for example, let's say the company name column really doesn't suit my needs. I just want to say company, you know, we know what the name is. I just want to call this company. So I'm going to say my company name is as and I'm going to enter double quotes to show that this is an alias that I'm using for my column header. I'm just going to call it company. All right, I'm okay with that. And I want to change a few more titles here. Contact name, I don't like that. That doesn't look good. I just want to make this contact. Maybe I want to make this contact full name. I think that sounds better. All right, so I like that, all right? And if you're using the editor, you'll see how the red line comes in if you're missing a syntax to make sure that it's formatted correctly. So you have those little helper indicators here as well. Contact title, again, I don't like that either. I just wanna say title. And I think the only other thing I wanna change here is postal code. I really just wanna say zip code. Okay. So I've changed four column headers here in my query. I'm going to execute this and you're going to see what's going to happen. Well, I got a little syntax error here. Okay, what's going on? I think what's going on here is that since I have aliases, my commas are now here in the wrong spot. So let me just try a quick test. And you know what? I think I'm wrong. I don't think that's got anything to do with it. And I'm right. That wasn't it. All right, what's going on? Let me read my statement in my error message a little more clearly. Okay, it tells me here where it is. It's in line one, line one's up here. Oh, I got a little extra character there that I don't need. It didn't know what to do with that plus sign. So let's take that out, let's run it. Okay, now it's happy. All right, cool. All right, so let's look at what we have. I have now company name being titled company. I have contact name as contact full name. I have contact title as title and I have postal code as zip code. All right, this is a good start. I think this looks much better when I export this file or if I make this a view to share with my user community, it makes much more sense, it looks better, and I'm happy. All right, so why don't you try this on your own? Why don't you continue to edit the customer's table, changing address to street address, and changing phone to company phone? All right, so make those two changes. Let's come back here and see how you did. 
Okay, so for the last exercise, what we wanted to do was change address to street address and change phone to company phone. So to do that, I would simply say as, and then I would type street address in between quotes next to the address column identifier. And then I would type as and enter company phone in quotes next to the phone column identifier. So if I do that and I click execute, I can see here on the bottom, address is now street address and phone is now company phone, all right? So compare your results to this. If you have something different, download this from the exercise files, compare your results, and then let's move on. In this exercise, we learned how to rename column headings to generate a more user-friendly result set for your users. In our next exercise, we'll start formatting actual data and you'll see how you can manipulate those results as well. Hey everyone, welcome back. Okay, now that we learned how to format column headers, we're going to go through how to format data values as well in your result set. So you'll find a lot in SQL that the default structure of a data value is really not how you wanna present it to your user community. And a date value is a very common example that you'll find yourself wanting to change frequently. So looking here in SQL Server, you can see how SQL Server sets up an order date. It's got a lot of information in here. This really is not user friendly. It's not how my users want to see this information. And I definitely want to make it look a lot better before I send this information out to my business. So by default, SQL Server is going to give you the year, the month, the date, and then a time step appended to that. All I really want is a month, day, and year in the order that I want to see it. So in this example, we're just going to show a very simple way to format an order date or format a date. You'll find many different formatting options with many different data types in SQL. And if you look in your browser for formatting SQL with any type of data that you see, you will see a lot of results. You can do formatting options for dates. We can also format text strings a certain way. Numerical formatting is something that's very common also with making numbers look like currencies and things along those lines. So you'll find yourself reformatting information very frequently. So in this example, we're going to keep it fairly straightforward and we're just going to change the date. And to do that using SQL Server, what the function is for that is to simply add the keyword format before the column that you want to change and then entering the format that you would like it to be. Now what's going to happen is by default, after it's reformatted, you're going to lose your column header because that specification is gone with the additional function and criteria that's around it. So to show you what that looks like, if I just click execute here, I get my reformatted date. That's great. This looks a lot better, but I lost my column header. So you need to remember also when you're doing these things to make sure you specify an alias so you clearly define what's in your column. So if I execute this, this looks great. My order date looks much better. It's just what I need to see. And it clearly shows what type of information is in this column. So why don't you try this on your own? Why don't you reformat order date and require date? And let's change the headers to have a space in between order date and required and date. All right. So try that. Let's come back here, see how you did and take it from there. Hey everyone. Okay. Let's look at your results. So here I have the results to the exercise file. I've reformatted required date and ship date to look different than what the system does for default, just like we did order date. And you'll notice what I did here also, I changed the format a little bit in required date and ship date. All of the formats in each column that you specify don't have to be exactly the same. You can make it different column by column. So if I look at this, th this looks much better. It looks much cleaner. I've also added in my customized column headers. This looks like a great data set for my user community and I'm very happy with it. All right, if your results look different, download this result file from the location chapters in this course, compare it to what you have, make any changes you need and let's move on. 
In this exercise, we learned how to format dates to make them more user-friendly. In our next exercise, we're actually going to start to execute some date calculations so you can see how you can forecast and project date values. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to SQL Query Fundamentals. In our last lesson, we learned how to format some data results. What we're going to start to look at now is to actually manipulate some data values so you can see calculated or derived values with both dates and financial information. So let's start with dates. If you're using SQL Server, more than likely you're going to have more than one instance where you're going to need to derive a date value, meaning you need not only know what are the dates that are in the system, but you need to kind of calculate some future dates or past dates and derive some new values to do manipulation with your result set to get the kind of reporting that you need. Fortunately, SQL Server has a wide variety of date functions to help you accomplish that task. Now, the two functions that we're going to look at in this lesson are called date add and date diff. And you'll find that you're going to be more than likely using these quite frequently. So let's talk about these for a few minutes before we start to set some examples. Date diff calculates the difference between two dates based on the unit of time you specify. And what that means is you can say, give me the months between two dates, give me the days between two dates, give me the weeks between two dates, and you can even do time as well. So you can specify what unit of time you want to see the difference of, days, months, weeks, hours, minutes, seconds, specify your start date, and specify your end date. The result is going to be the difference between these two dates. The second function we're going to look at is date add. So again, with date add, you want to clarify your unit of time. So what are you adding? Are you adding hours, minutes, days, weeks? You want to identify the amount of time you want to add. If you say it's weeks, is it five weeks? Is it 10 weeks? Is it two weeks? And then you want to enter the date you want to add that value to. And again, that date can either be a value that you type in here, say I want to start with January 1st, 2021, or you can pick a date field in your table, which you will more than likely do, and then show the additional value that's derived from that calculation. Okay. All right. So we're going to look at these two functions. So let's start with date diff. Okay. Let's start with this one. So we're going to be working in our orders table in this example. And what I would like to know is what is the difference between the order date and the required date? So I want to know the time span in between those two dates. And I want to know how many days are in between those two dates. All right. That's going to be our example. All right. So let's try this and see what happens. So I'm using date diff. So I'm just going to copy this down here into my SQL query. So I have my syntax and I know exactly where I need to put my fields. Okay. So first thing I need to know is what's the unit of time? Well, I want to do days, right? So days is DD. That's my identifier for days. And if you just query or if you just Google up these functions in your browser, you'll see a series of examples of the identifiers that you need to do per intervals. It's basically fairly logical. Days is DD, weeks is WW, hours is HH. So it's, it's fairly easy to follow along and understand what you need to enter to get your unit of time. All right, so what's my start date? My start date is going to be my order date. All right, that's the first date that I want to start the calculation from. So I'm just going to copy this and I'm going to paste it right in here. And then what's my end date? The end date is required. So I want to know what's the required date for this order and the difference between that and when they actually ordered their products. All right, so let's look at this. So all my little red lines left, so I know my syntax is good. Those are good helpers that you have in your SQL tools. I have date, diff, DD, order date, and required date. And we're going to name this just so we know what we're, what we're going to be looking at. I'm going to say as diff of dates. All right. We don't need to get too formal on this. Just want to identify what our result set is. And I actually want that to show in my result set after my order date and my required date so I can see sequentially how the calculation happens. All right. All right. So looks, looks good. So let's click this off and see what happens. All right, here's what we have. So order date on this first order is 7-4-1996. Wow, this is old. 
And then the required date is 8 1 1996. The number of days between those two dates is 28. Okay, so that's how that works. So if you look through the rest of this data set, you'll see those calculations. I now have the number of days in between these two dates. That's exactly what I want. Okay, excellent. All right, let's look at date add really quick while we're still here. So same thing, date add is gonna be my unit of time, the amount of time I wanna add, and then what's the date that I wanna add the time to, all right? So let's stick with the fields that we're currently working with. And let's say for this, I wanna add four weeks to my order date. That's gonna be my example, all right? So my unit of time is weeks, okay? So I wanna know how many weeks are gonna be ahead of this. The amount of time I wanna add is four. And then the date I wanna add this to is my order date. Okay, that looks good. So I've got date add weeks for order date, and we're gonna call this as order date future. All right, we'll just give it that name, that's fine. All right, so let's click this off and see what we get. All right, here we go. Order date future is over here. Four weeks from the order date of 7-4-1996 brings us to 8-1-1996. I have my actual date here that shows what the new value is based on what the order date was. And I know exactly when four weeks ahead of the order date will be. Okay? Okay. Okay, so why don't you try some of this on your own? Here is your exercise. Two asks. Number one, calculate 15 days prior to ship date. Okay, so it's going to be a negative value for your amount of time. Just a little tip and trick there. And then the difference in days between the order date and ship date. Okay, so again, we're in the orders table. Pause this video. Try to put together those two functions in your SQL statement. Come back here and we'll see how you did. All right, let's look at your exercise and see how you did. So I'm showing here on the screen the examples of the functions we were trying to perform. Let's start with the first one, calculate 15 days prior to ship date. So what I needed to do here is use my date add function. My identifier is days. My time is negative 15 because I'm going earlier in time. And my date that I'm calculating from is ship date. That's gonna give me the days prior to ship. And if you look down here in the results set, you can see in the first example, the ship date is 716 and 15 days prior to that is 71. So I see my correct value there. The next function was to find the difference in days between order date and ship date. So I'm gonna use my date diff function for that. Again, I'm gonna use days as my time interval and my two dates are order date and ship date. I share the difference between those days. That's 12. If you look at the first example, order date is 7-4, ship date is 7-16, and my difference is 12. All right. Okay. In this lesson, we learned about performing date calculations. You'll find you're going to be using date add and date diff quite a lot. Next, we're going to look at using aggregate functions to summarize data values, all right? So we're gonna to start to look at some numbers so you can see how to manipulate financial information, do some averaging, counting, and summing of values to get a summarized result in your data set. All right, see you in the next lesson. In this lesson, we're gonna learn how to summarize values or find derived values beyond dates so you can manipulate financial and numerical information. So here's what we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at a few functions in, in this lesson. We're gonna look at average, sum, count, min, and max. And basically what this gives you is exactly what it indicates. You're gonna pick a value in your table and you're gonna say, give me the average value of all the records in here to see what my overall average result is. The same goes through for sum. What is the accumulated value of a set of records? That's gonna be a common function you're more than likely gonna find yourself doing. You're frequently gonna to wanna to know what is the count of a result set in your table. And that can just be anywhere from just how many rows are in this table, because in real life tables are very large. And if you count the number of rows, it helps you manage and analyze your queries as they get more complex to make sure you're not seeing duplicate results. And that's something that's covered in advanced SQL lessons, but the count function is something that you're going to find yourself using quite frequently as well. 
Likewise, you can also say, well, what's the minimum value of this result set and what's the maximum value of this result set? So these are very simple calculations that you can execute in your table. We're going to walk through all of these in this lesson. All right, so for this lesson, I'm in my products table, and all we're going to worry about is the field we're going to perform these calculations on, okay? Now, when you do aggregated queries, which is what this is called, you're going to find that when you're summarizing numerical data, you also have to group by the additional columns that you're asking for in your result set. Now, in this lesson, we're just going to concentrate on the financial functions. Group by is covered in a later lesson, so that'll make more sense when we get to it. Right now, I'm just going to concentrate on the field that I want to do the financial calculation from. So in this example, we're going to be working with unit price. Okay, so we're going to be working with this field. And here's the questions that I'm going to answer. I want to know how many products do I have in my table? I want to know what is the average price of all my products. I want to know what is the accumulated value of all my unit prices. I want to know what, what's the minimum unit price of all my products. And I want to know what's the maximum unit price of all my products. Okay. So these five functions are going to give us that information. So let's just streamline this to only show what we need. And all we're going to be looking at here is unit price. So I'm going to take out all these other columns. And it is a very simple process to do this. All you need to do here is identify the function that you want to put in before the name of your field, wrap it in parentheses, and you're going to get your results. So super simple. Let's start with count. How many products do I have? Well, let's find out. I want to count my unit prices. Actually, for this, we're going to use the actual product ID because that makes more sense. You can count any unique value, but in this example, I'm looking for products. So let's stick with product ID and count that. I would get the same result whether I used unit price or products, but we'll stick with product ID so this kind of makes more sense. All right, so let's execute that result and see what I get. I have 77 records, okay? Now, if I just looked at all of my rows in here, because this is a very small table, and I went down to the bottom, I can see here it's 77 rows. So I know that that's correct. Now in the real world, your tables are going to be much larger than this. So it's performance intensive to try to scroll down to your result set and see your total number of values. The SQL tool you're using might not give you that identifier there on the bottom. So count is a super simple way to see exactly how many rows you have. All right, so we've done that. What's next? We want to know the average price of all your products. All right, very cool. So let's replace count with average. And on this one, I want to use unit price. That's my field, right? So I'm just going to replace that in there. I see my little helpers. I know I typed it right. Perfect. What's the average price of all the unit prices in my products table? Let's find out. Okay. My average price is 28.8663. Now in the formatting examples we learned in the prior lessons, you can make this value look more user-friendly if you're going to be sending this to a end user as a result set by using rounding and taking away the trailing numbers from the decimal. All right, next up is sum. What's the accumulated value of all my unit prices in my table? Super simple. We're just going to replace average with sum. Kick this off. Boom, there I have it. Okay, so if I add up all the unit prices of all my products, I get 2,222.71. Super simple. All right, min and max is the same thing. You know exactly where we're going with this, right? So min, what's the least expensive unit price I have for all my products. Oh, it's $2.50. All right, that's pretty cheap. That's a good value. And what's my maximum unit price for all my products? I type max on there. I get 263.5. Excellent. Now, this is just one value that you're showing. Like I said, when we get to the group by lessons in this program, you'll see how you can show this summarized value with additional columns so I can see exactly what is the product that is $263.50. Likewise, what is the product that is just $2.50? So you get a real informative result set for your user base. Okay, so why don't you guys try this on your own? For this exercise, use the order details table, find the accumulated values of all the unit prices in all the orders in order details, and find out how many rows there are in the order details table. 
All right. Those are your two tasks. Pause this video. Try those on your own. Come back here. We'll see how you did. Okay, for this last exercise, you're asked to do two things. Calculate the accumulated unit price value of all the orders in the order details table and find the number of rows in the order details table also. So here are the two statements that make that happen. The first one we'll look at is the accumulated value. I used unit price as my field that I wanted to summarize from. If I run this, I see that comes to 565.00.91. The next ask was to count the number of rows in the order details table. I used order ID as my field here. You could have used any field because you'll get the detailed result. If I execute that, I get 2,155 rows. And I know that that's correct. All right. Okay. So in this lesson, we covered uh, the basics of financial aggregate functions. We talked about summarize, minimum, maximum, average, and counting. In our next lesson, we are going to manipulate some text values, okay? So we saw this a little bit in the very beginning. Remember, there was a field that had a concatenated value. That's what I called it, where they put the first name and the last name together. We'll show you how to do that in the next lesson and also pull out a substring of characters from a field so you can only see the partial results, all right? So let's get started with that, and I'll see you in the next lesson. In this lesson, we're going to look at two string functions. We're going to look at concat, that's short for concatenate, and we're going to look at substring. Now, concat, if you remember, we saw an example of when we put our initial database together, we actually saw where they put together the last name and first name fields. Substring shows you the partial value of a text string field, so you can only pull out what you need. Let's start with concat. In this example, we're going to put together the last name and the title of courtesy to make a formal last name. So I'm going to just copy the syntax for this function so that it makes it easier for me to put it together. And I'm going to paste this down here. And I'm going to put in my fields. Concat is fairly simple. All it's asking you for are the fields that you're trying to put together. So let's start there. What do I want to put together? I want to put together my title of courtesy. So I'm going to put that in my first field. And I want to put together my last name. So I'm going to put that in my second field. So let's just start here and see how this looks. I'm going to call this something. And run it. There we go. OK. So let's see what I have. I have formal name. I have my title of courtesy here, doctor, and then Fuller is my last name. This looks good, but I want to make it look a little better. I want a space in between the title of courtesy and the last name. And that's very easy to do. You can enter values as information that you want to concatenate as well as actual field references. All you need to do for that is make sure everything is separated out by a comma. So after my first comma, I'm going to use single quotes to enter the space that I want in between my title of courtesy and my last name. I'm going to make sure I have another comma after that so that it knows that's the end of that request. And the next part of that is the actual last name field. If I run this again, it looks a little better. I have a space in between Dr. and Fuller. So this looks perfect to me. This is exactly what I want to see. All right, the next thing we're going to look at is substring. Substring shows you the partial value of a field based on the starting point you specify in that field and the number of characters you want to start after. This comes in quite handy in a lot of instances when you just want the first relevant part of a field. Maybe there's a name that has some suffixes afterwards that, that are the last four characters. You want to take those out. Or in some phone number fields, you might want to take out the area code and just have the name, the main phone number on there or just show the area code. In this example, we're just going to look at the title field so I can show you how the starting point works and the number of characters works that you're pulling out. So from the field that we want to start with here, we're going to pick title. So let's just take title and put it in there as our starting field. And I want to start at the very first character. So you can start this at any point in the field. And I'll show you some examples after we get past this first example. And then you just want to tell it how many characters you want after that starting point. Now let's just say we want five. 
All right, let's, let's just call this partial title. All right, so all I'm going to show now are the first five characters of the title field. That's exactly what this is going to give me. Let's run it. All right, and here we go, right here. You see the first five characters. There's a space after vice, so and it counts a space as a character placeholder. So that's why there's only four characters that are showing here on the first one. The rest of them, you can see, you see the first five values that gives you that for a title. Now let's just say you wanted the last five values or you wanted, um, I wanted to start at the fourth character of this field and then give me the five characters after that. You just change your starting point. If you execute that, you can see here, here's what you get. Okay. So this is a good example of how this works. It's starting at the fourth character. That's E. You have that space. And then you have the PRE after that to make your total of five characters. All right. Okay. So why don't you try some of this on your own? On your own, why don't you concatenate the home phone and extension all right, so those are two fields over here. Here's extension and here's home phone. So put those two fields together and make it look nice. And then show the phone numbers without the area code for USA countries only. All right, so you're also gonna use that where clause that we learned way back when. Enter that in your query and then show the phone number without the area code for the phone numbers that are in USA. All right, so pause this video, try these two examples on your own, come back here and let's see how you did. All right, in this first exercise, you were asked to put together the extension and the home phone to make a full phone field. So for that, you should have used the concat function. We're gonna enter home phone. I put in a little space here to make that look a little nicer and then the extension field. So let's run this and see how this looks. All right, here we have it. Here's my full phone. Here's the extension with the home phone number. That looks exactly the way that I want it to. The next ask was to show the phone number without the area code for phones that were in the country of USA. So let's go down there and see how to put that together. So I used two separate substring functions for this because I wanted to show just my area code and then I wanted to show the phone number without the area code because I now have that in a separate field. I also remember to go down here and put my filter criteria in using the where clause because I'm only doing this for phone numbers that are in the United States. So my first substring function shows the home phone. I'm starting at the first character. And I want the first six characters because that's what gives me the entire area code for my USA phone numbers. And then my second function starts at character number seven because I want to pull out everything after the area code to just show that phone number for my data set. So let's run this query. Let's see how those results come out. And here we have it. Here's my USA area code. I'm showing just the area code for the phone number. And here's the rest of the phone number over here in my USA phone field. All right. Okay, in this exercise, we learned how to manipulate text values. We learned how to use two functions, concatenate and substring, so that you can put fields together and only show the relevant values that you may need from a text field. In our next exercise, we're going to start to order information and group by information. So as we referenced earlier with financial functions, you'll see how to put those summarized financial values in with other columns and you'll see how to sort those values to show the information that's most relevant to you up top and then the information that's the least relevant to you down later on in the results set. All right, so let's get to it and let's keep learning. In this exercise, let's look at order by and group by. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit already. Order by is very simple. It's just going to give you your results sorted in this order that you specify based on the value of a certain field. Group by is going to show you additional columns that you can add to your summarized fields to show exactly what those accumulated values are. So let's start with order by. Simple example, let's work in our order details table. We only have a few columns here. 
And let's say for here, I want to make sure that I see this result starting from the largest units price and working my way down. So very simply, all you're going to do is after your table reference in your from clause, you're going to say order by, those are your keywords. You're going to specify the field or the column you want to order your result set by. In this example, it's going to be unit price. And then you're going to say, do you want to see it highest to lowest or lowest to highest? So let's just say we want to start with lowest to highest. So that's ascending. It's going to be ascending or descending order. That's what you want to clarify. So ASC is my keyword for ascending. I run this and I see everything from the lowest priced unit price. If I just kind of scroll down here so you can see the results here, the values are accumulating as we're scrolling down through the table set. Now, if you want to go in the opposite direction, and I want to see my highest unit prices first, super simple. All you're going to do is change ASC to DESC. That's your keyword for descending. Run it again. Now I see my highest values. And we saw these when we were using the min max functions as well. Here are the actual products that have that high value of 263.50. And if you scroll down, you can see how those values are decreasing as you get through your table set. So in addition to order by, you can also do something called group by. Now we saw in an earlier lesson where we saw the accumulated value of a unit price, right? So we were able to summarize this numerical value and show the total number or the summary of the unit values in the products table. That was great, but that's not really relevant in a real life scenario. A real scenario would be, I wanted to see the full unit price of a full order that is in my database so I can see exactly what the order totals are that are coming in. Now that's something that you would really wanna see in the real world. So let's try to show that here using the group by clause to bring additional columns in to the summarized value result so you can actually see what those values pertain to. So let's start with the accumulated value of the financial information, which was just using the sum function on unit price. So let's start there and put that here in this order details example. So I'm gonna do that now. I'm going to enter sum and I'm going to put that on the unit price column. And I'll just give this a temporary identifier. And I'm going to start with just showing that column so you can see how the additional columns come into play. All right, if I do that and I take out my comma, I'm going to take out that. And I just want to see that one big value here. Let's see what happens. Okay, here's my number, 56500.91. I remember that number before, and I know that's correct. So now I want better information. From this order details table, I want to know what the total value is of each of my orders in this order details table. Now, if you look at the raw data on here, you're gonna see that the information in here is separated out by product ID. So you see how you have a couple of rows that have the same order ID. That means very simply that this order has these three products in it. Here's the unit price of each of those. Here's the quantity and here's the discount. All we're going to look at in this example is the accumulated singular unit price of each of the products in the order. All right. So we're not going to work with quantity right now. All I want to know is for each of these single unit prices, what's the total of that by order? Okay. So this is where we can use the group by clause and the sum of our unit price to see that information. Now, if I just try to bring in order ID in my results set, and I just try to run this. I'm going to show you what's going to happen. I get this error message. Now this error message means that I have a summary function on one of my fields, but I don't have that on the other field. So I'm asking for conflicting results. I'm asking to give me all the order IDs, so those detailed rows, and I'm asking it to give me the sum or the aggregated value of unit price. It can't do that. It has to be one or the other. I'm either asking for a summary result set or I'm asking for a detail result set. So when you see this error message, invalid because 
it's not consistent to either a singular or an aggregate function. What that is telling you is that you need to make sure that you group by or summarize your other fields in addition to your financial information. And here's how you do that. What you would do is after you write your statement, you would simply add group by after your table reference and the additional column or columns that you're adding in to put that together with your summarized financial field. Now, if I run this, excellent. Now I know the total price of each individual unit price of all the products that are in each order. You see how the order IDs now are unique. They're no longer duplicated because I'm showing the accumulated unit price of all the products in each order. Okay, so why don't you try this yourselves? For your exercise, I want you to go back to the products table and I want you to show me the accumulated unit price of all the products for each supplier ID, all right? So you're gonna group by supplier ID and you're gonna summarize your unit price. All right, pause this video, give that a try on your own, come back here and we'll see how you do. In your last exercise, you were asked to show the summary of the unit prices by supplier ID in the products table. So here's how the query should look. We're asking for two fields, supplier ID and unit price. We're summarizing or we're aggregating a unit price and are grouping that by supplier ID. So I have my two fields referenced here. I'm using my sum function for unit price and I'm grouping by supplier ID. Let's run this. And there we go. We have the total unit price by supplier ID. Each supplier ID is a unique value and I see my accumulated total prices by supplier. All right, in this last exercise, we looked at two functions. Number one, we learned how to order our information by ascending or descending order. And we learned how to group our aggregate columns to show more specified results in our data set to show what our accumulated financial values pertain to. In our next exercises, we're gonna look at ranking. So in addition to ordering, you can also rank columns, giving them a rank number so you can see where they fall in your results set. And we're also gonna look at some more ways to filter grouped data. So in addition to the where clause, there's something called a having clause that gives you a different result set. We'll walk through that example as well. In this example, we're gonna look at ranking. Ranking is somewhat useful if you need to put a specific priority against what your results are. So I'm just gonna show you at a very high level where this is valuable. In this example, we're just gonna use the suppliers table to show what we're setting our rank on and how those results come out. So from the suppliers table, I'm looking at my supplier IDs, my company name, and I'm seeing what country they're in. And I'm using country as my ranking identifier to say, depending on what country they're in, give them a ranking number and show me the results either in ascending or descending order. So what it does at a high level is just use the rank keyword to show the highest or lowest priority based on what you're specifying it to order by. And in this example, it's country. So it's ranking them by country and it's going in alphabetical order that you can see. So using that trigger, the results that comes out to be the countries with the First letter A become number one, then B is your next level, C is your next level, and it works its way through the ranks that way. Now you can see how the ranks aren't all sequential in numerical order. That's for a variety of reasons. It can be how many records are in that initial rank, how many rows and what the categories are in the results that you're asking for. So there's actually a few variables that are going to contribute to the separation in the sequence of the ranks. But as just a very high level example on where you can use ranking in some of your results, if that's needed for some financial information, the rank function can give you a few varieties to do that in. 
In this lesson, we're going to talk about the having clause. The having clause allows you to filter criteria from summarized data. So just like we learned how to use where in our earlier lessons, when you start to get into making the calculated values and summarizing information, you can filter out that aggregated results set as well. So let's look at this example here. I'm looking at information from the order details table, right? We're very familiar with that table right now. So I'm showing you where we're starting from at the aggregation level. I'm counting my number orders. I'm including product IDs. I'm summarizing my unit prices. I'm taking this all from the single table order details and I'm grouping by product ID. Okay, so I have everything that I need to get my aggregated set. This is fantastic, I'll run this. I have exactly what I need here, okay? Here's what I know. I know that product ID 23 is in 20 orders and it has an accumulated unit price value of 167.40. All right, so this is great. So let's say you don't need all this information. You're only really worried about higher level information that is of a minimum value. All right, I'll say it like that. And here's what that means. I don't wanna see everything in here. I just wanna know what the number of orders are with the products for everything that has an accumulated value over, let's say $400, okay? So that's where we use the having clause. The having clause is going to let you show a filtered result of summarized values. Now, the difference between the where clause and the having clause is the where clause filters out information before it calculates the result set and the having clause filters out information after you calculate your result set. So in this example, number one, if we use the where clause, we're gonna get an error message and I'll show you that because number one, the where clause is asking you for details that you can't acquire now because you're accumulating your results. And the having clause lets you accumulate those results first and then do your filter. So if I try to use where right here, I'm gonna get an error message. So let me show you what's gonna happen if I do that. If I enter in here where the sum of the unit price is greater than 400, I'm conflicting myself. I'm contradicting myself. I'm asking for the details of an aggregated value, and that's a no-no. So if I do this, I'm going to get a big old error message here. We've seen this before. We're not using correct function specifications by sticking to aggregated clauses. So in order to get a filter result from this, I have to use the clause having. And what I do is after my group by statement, I enter my having specifications. So now after I do all this, I only want to see the result set having an accumulated unit price of greater than 400. Okay. So first let's run the first result set. Let's look at that. I have 77 rows here. I always look at my row count just to see I can confirm that I'm getting a filtered result after I put in my additional information. Now, if I run this query again, using having, all right, I only have 46 rows, so I know something happened. And if I looked at all this, I can see that all of my values are greater than 400. Okay, in our last two lessons, we talked about rank and having. Rank is not that popular in a lot of areas, but can be useful when you do require some priority in your data result. And having is definitely useful as you're working through your aggregated result set to show filter criteria on accumulated values. All right, next we're going to move on to some more complex financial expressions with summarized data so you can see how to calculate your values even more and get more information out of your data source. Okay, in this exercise, we're gonna look at using mathematical functions on your data. So we saw how to summarize and average and count and show the minimum and show the maximum, but we can actually execute mathematical functions on our data to get additional va derived values as well. So let's go into our products table and let's work in here and make some calculations. So here's what I wanna do. I want to put a markup on my unit price and then I wanna see what the total sales price is gonna be based on that markup, all right? So what that means is I'm gonna take the unit price field, I'm gonna put a markup on it, and let's just say we're gonna do a markup of 20%, okay? And then I wanna know what that sales price is gonna be. So I need to know what my unit price plus my markup is gonna to be to equal my sales price. Sound good? 
All right, let's see what we can do here. So in my products table, the first thing I'm going to do is put my markup on my unit price field. So let's take our unit price field. And I want to keep that there because I want to see the original value. And this is always useful when you're trying to do financial and mathematical calculations like this. You always want to keep a reference point of your original value just so you can do a quick quality check on your calculation. Make sure you're, you're seeing what you want to see. So I'm going to add a unit price. And then I, what do I want to do here? I want to mark this up by 20%. So how do I do that? Well, I times unit price times 0.20, right? So let's just type that out using your regular keyboard functions to use your mathematical operators. The asterisk is a multiplier, the slash is divide. You can plus and you can minus, okay? So we're gonna times that by 0.20. And I'm kind of creating my own little function here. So I'm gonna put this in parentheses and I'm gonna call this something. I'm gonna call this as markup, all right? So this is gonna be my, my markup. Okay. All right. So let's start here and see what we got here. So I got my columns here. I added one more specific in here. Let's see what we have. Okay. So this is good. This is my markup. My markup for my unit price, which is 18. So 20% of 18 is 3.6. All right. I have my extra zeros here. That's fine. I'm not going to show this to anybody. So I don't need to do any kind of rounding or formatting. I know exactly how much my additional value is going to be when I create my sales price based on my markup with my unit price, all right? So now let's figure out our sales price. Our sales price is gonna be our markup plus our unit price. So how do we put that in here? Well, we're gonna make another column. We're gonna start off with unit price. And then we're gonna add in the markup. Now the markup is the field times 20, right? So I need this whole piece of information and I need to add it to my original value. And I need to name this sales price. Okay, let's try that and see what we get. All right, there we go. Here's my sales price. Here's my original value, 18. My markup is 3.6. Makes my sales price 21.6. Okay, so why don't you try two steps on your own? Let's do this. Let's try to figure out what the total value is of the unit price based on the units in stock. Okay, so unit price, units in stock, and then find out the difference between the units in stock and the units on order. Okay, so units in stock and units on order. All right, so pause this video, try those on your own, come back here, and we'll see how you did. In the last exercise, we looked at two values. We looked at the total value of unit price based on the units in stock and the difference between units in stock and units on order. So let's look at our first calculation. The total value of unit price based on units in stock. So I'm taking my unit price and I'm timesing it by the number of units that I have in stock. I name that total unit value. Let's look at that. If I times 18 by 39, I get 702. I see my total value there. The next calculation I wanted was the difference between units in stock and units on order. So I'm subtracting these two fields. I'm taking my units in stock. I'm subtracting it by the units on order. And I'm getting my stock versus order value. Let's look at that. My units in stock here was 39. My units in order on zero. I still have 39 in stock. That's great. If I look at my next one, I have 17 in stock. I have 40 on order, so I'm short 23. So this is good information. I now know I have to do something. I have to order more product, right? Because I need it for my customers. So here's a way where you can use mathematical expressions to derive values and make decisions in your results set. All right, in this past exercise, we learned how to use mathematical calculations to create derived values. In our next exercise, we are going to Look how to do something called pivoting. Now, if you're using SQL, you may be very familiar with spreadsheets in Excel and Google Sheets. And if you are a spreadsheet user, you have more than likely tried to do a pivot table on more than one occasion. It is a very handy tool. It's very powerful in the way it shows your results set. SQL actually has a pivot function that allows you to do that same type of task and show your result sets reversing the rows and the columns. We'll walk through that in our next lesson. 
All right, let's look at pivot as a function in SQL and show you how that can manipulate your results set. So when you're looking at information in a database, it's very straightforward, right? If I wanted to see my products and my categories from the products table, I look at those two fields and I see rows listed of my values. Now there's times when you wanna show this in a different order. Like what you'd really wanna see is say, the total number of products based on a category. And we learned how to do that, right? We learned how to say, okay, I want my total number of projects, which is my count. And then I wanna group by category ID. And if I do this, okay, I got my products by category. I know I got 12 for one, 12 for two, 12 for three, 10 for four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, that's great. And that's good. But there's many times when you would like to see this ordered differently. So I would like to see my category ID values as my columns and then the accumulated products of those columns underneath to look more like a table. Well, there's something called a pivot function that allows you to do that. Now to do pivot, you have to take a few steps. The first step is to just start with the fields that you wanna pivot on. So before you even get into aggregating and counting and grouping, just start from the very beginning on what are the two fields that you wanna show in your result set. So let's start there. Let's take a step back. Let's run this. Okay, so all I'm really concerned about right now is my product ID and my category ID. All right, great. Now, the next thing you wanna do is figure out what do you want to pivot on? Now, in this example, I wanna show the count or the accumulation of the product ID, let's say by the first eight category IDs, all right? We have got a lot in here. Actually, we only have eight. Okay, perfect. So we have eight categories. So I wanna show the accumulated value of the products by each category. All right, so let's just type that out to start out with. So we wanna count product ID. And we wanna do that for the category IDs, all right? So let's identify what we wanna do here with our product IDs. We wanna pivot, right? So we're gonna type in our keyword pivot and we wanna do this for our category IDs. Now what we have to do when we do a pivot is we have to specify out the category IDs that we want to do this pivot on. So what we're going to need to do is list the category IDs included in these columns. So I'm going to say in, open my parentheses, and then I have to list out the categories. Well, we know we have eight, right? So it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. I'm gonna close my parentheses. Now, because I want these to be columns, I also have to clarify that they are column headers by putting in square brackets around those values. So this is the syntax that we need to use for pivoting to show what we want our columns to be. Now, the next thing we have to do is separate these statements out because what we're doing is we're saying, here's our raw data, here's what we're picking from, and then here's what we're doing with that raw data. And for pivot, you have to separate those pieces of information. And to do that, what you do is you wrap your initial statement in parentheses, okay? So we're kind of identifying that as our raw data. And we have to give this an identifier. So when you wrap a query like this, and you'll see this when we get into subqueries, you just have to give an, an identifier to that that table reference so that it knows what to pick up in the additional function clauses. So 
You can use any alias that you want. A single letter is the best approach because it makes it easier to call on and reference when your queries get very large. So I'm just going to call this T, all right? So I'm just going to say this statement is my T tables reference. And I have down here what I'm going to do with that. I'm going to pivot on that. And then the next thing I need to do is show what I want to do with this. I want to show this as a pivot table. So to do that, I'm going to put in a wrapping select statement. I'm going to say select all from this initial table set result, pivot on this, and I have to show what I want to call this as. I'm going to call this as just pivot result. All right, so it gets a little categorized here. You have to separate your statements from what your raw data is and what you're trying to do here. We do that by wrapping our raw data in a specific select statement that we put in a, an identifier against. And then we show here what we're going to do with it. All right, so I'm reading this. I see some red lines here, which means I'm missing something. Oh, my little parentheses here. Okay, so my pivot is my included statement in here. This is my result set. This is my starting set. Let's run this and see what happens. Okay, there we go. Now, we're only showing two simple values here, so it doesn't look very user-friendly. As you get into adding more columns and using your group by, this will be a better displayed result set. But for this example, it shows you what we we're trying to accomplish. My category IDs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, show the number of products that we have in each one of those categories, 12, 12, 13, 10, seven, six, five, and 12. So I can see the number of products in each categories, and it shows in a more user-friendly table fashion. Okay, so why don't you try this on your own? I'm using the order details table, all right? So go to the order details table and let's count the number of orders for products one through 10, all right? That's your ask. So use this example as your syntax reference, change your table to be the order detail tables, and then we're pivoting on the product IDs one through 10, and we're looking at the accumulated orders that have that product in them. All right, give that a shot on your own, come back here and we'll see how you All right, let's look at our exercise. So we were looking in the order details table and we wanted to see the number of orders for products one through 10, okay? So using our pivot table syntax, we're gonna start off with our raw data, which is just the product IDs and the order IDs from the order details table. And then we're going to pivot that accumulated total of order IDs by product ID. So my product IDs one through 10 are gonna be my columns and my number of orders that hold those products are gonna be my values underneath. So if I run this, I have my product IDs one through 10, and I can say product ID number one is in 33 orders, two is in 44, three is in 12, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so in this exercise, we learned how to use pivot as a function to transpose your rows and your columns. In our next lesson, we're gonna move on to pulling in data from more than one table. So it is very rare that all the information you need is in a single table. So what you are gonna find yourself doing a lot is joining tables together. So we'll talk about joins, how to link two tables together, make sure you're only accumulating unique information and not duplicate rows, and the variety of ways you can make that happen. In this exercise, we're going to look at joining tables. Rarely will you find all your information in one table. So you will find a lot that you're going to have to join more than one table together to get the entire result set that you're looking for. Now, in order to make this happen, we have to manipulate some information in our Northwind database, okay? Because I want to show you the three types of main joins that you're going to be using. First off, there's something called a join, which is an inner join. And basically what that means is just give me all of the records that are in both of these tables based on the unique identifier that I tell you. And we'll walk through that process. The next thing that you're gonna wanna know is how to do a left join or a right join. And what that basically means is just 
you can specify whether you, you want all the records from both your tables that you're going to get in a regular inner join, or if you want all the records just from the table of the left of the clause, or if you want all the records from the table of the right of the join clause. And I'll show you how that result set varies based on if you say left, right, or inner, and you can see exactly where you can set your source table to get your records from. Now, in order to do this, we need to make sure that we have some records in one table that's not in another table. Now, for the Northwind database that we have as our example, they don't have that set up by default. So we have to make one quick edit to one of our tables to be able to show joins accurately in this exercise. So it's really very simple. All we need to do is open up the regions table in our SQL server. And then what you want to do is just right click on it and select edit top 200 rows. SQL Server lets you do very easy inline editing where you can very easily just type in a new value for records to add into your table. So all we're going to do is add in one record into our region table. Let's call this South West and we'll give it a region ID of five. Okay. Now, if you're not using SQL Server, you're using your own solution. See if you can find two tables that have a common column, but don't have the same number of results in each table. I know that doesn't sound like that's very easy to find, but see what you can do. What you can also do is do this same exercise, add in a specific record to a table so that you'll know you'll see that in a result set, whether we're using a left or a right join. Okay. So that being said, let's add this record in here. Let's save this. All right, that should be good to go. Let's go back in here and just make sure we have that new value in there. There it is, that Southwest. Okay, so let's take a look at joins. Now, in order to execute a join, you need to have a common column in both tables to link. So let's look at the table's territory and the table region in our Northwind database. So if I just look at my columns in my territories table, I have three. I have territory ID, I have territory description, and I have region ID. If I look at my columns in my region table, I have two. I have region ID and I have region description. Now, in order to join two tables together, each of them need to have a common column, all right? Because you need something to join on. What you're saying is give me all of these records from this table that also have records in that table. And you have to give it something to link to so it knows what to match. In this example, we have region ID as the column that's in both of these tables. So we're going to execute a very simple inner join linking region and territories using region ID. Now, when we're using more than one table, we have to use aliases to reference our columns so that when we are clarifying the columns that we want, the query knows what table to pick those columns up from. So let's start there. Let's start with territories. So I'm going to take all my columns. I'm going to take territory ID, description and region ID. That's fine from territories. And I'm going to give this an identifier of T. Now, like we talked about earlier, you can give a table reference, any kind of identifier you want. You want to keep it logical and keep it simple because you're going to have to keep typing this reference repeatedly. So I usually use the first letter of the table to make it easy to reference. So I know where all my information is coming from. So let's call territories T and let's call region R. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pull both of the columns in from each of these tables, but we're going to make sure we're not going to duplicate information. So I don't want something that's called a Cartesian join or a Cartesian product where I'm going to get a slew of information. If I just put these together, that's duplicated rows based on all the columns that are in each of these tables. That's not going to give you accurate information. I want to see my region ID and my region description based on the region ID of the territories versus the region table. So to do that, we're going to first start off with the columns that are in the territories table. And I have to make sure I set the table identifier for these columns because I'm going to add my region columns in this result set also. So I'm telling it first off, I want the territory ID description and region ID from the territories T column. And then I also want the region ID and the region description from the region column. So I'm going to add those in here and I'm going to clarify that these come from the region table. So I'm going to put my R in front of those. 
and then I need to make sure that I include region with territories in my from clause. Okay, so I have both of my tables here. I can get rid of this because I've put my information together. I've condensed everything. I have all of my columns from both of those tables referenced in this one select statement. So now I kind of have to give it some direction on how to pull this information. So I need to tell it what I want it to do and what columns to link. Well, what I want to do is I want to join territories to region. And I want to join them on territory region ID must equal region region ID. Now let's run this and see what we get. All right, this looks good. Okay. I have about 53 rows and we'll clarify that in one second. I have all my columns. I have my matching region IDs from both tables so I can make sure this is accurate. I know this is is. It says that all the region IDs in region match the region IDs in territories. And here's my region description to my territories that gives you a more comprehensive result set. Now, I wanna make sure this is right. So I always do that by looking at the number of rows that I get back in my result set. I have 53 rows. Now I'm doing an inner join. So I know that the max number of rows between the two tables is 53. And if I just start with my territories table to verify that, I see I have 53 rows. That's great. I know I got all my information. Now, this is excellent if you're just showing specifically the equal number of rows from both of your tables. When we start to use left or right, that tells the query engine what table to use as the master. So for example, if I said left join here, it's going to look at all the records in the table reference that's to the left of the joins. In this case, it's territories. And it's going to make sure I include all of those records, even if some of those regions might not be in the region table. Now we know that they are. So we're going to get the same result set as 53. And that's accurate. If we switch this and we said right join, you're telling the query engine to give you all the records to the right of this join clause, which in this case is region, and then just show me all the territories that match. Now, if we run this, we're gonna get 54. And the reason why that is, is because we added in that extra region when we set up our table, remember that? And even though there are no territories that have a Southwest region assigned to them, I'm still showing the Southwest region in my result set because I've clarified region as the master table to make sure I get all of my values from there first. So this is very powerful to know if I'm missing any information. So let's say for example, you have some sales reps who haven't entered any orders for the month. You want to make sure you get a query result that shows you all of your sales reps, not just the ones that have orders, but the ones that don't also, so you can see who is missing placing orders in their result set. So this is really powerful to use. You'll find yourselves using joins more than any other clause for the most part when you're writing your statements, because you will always have to bring information together from more than one table. Okay, so why don't you try a join clause on your own? Starting with the orders table, I want to know who the shipping vendor is for the orders. So I have in here the shipping ID. So I have one, two, or three. Doesn't tell me a lot of information. I want to see the name in there also. Okay, so if I look at my shippers table, I can see that one, two, and three have a company name and a phone. Um, I just want the company name. So just show the shipping company name in the orders result set. You can just add the column in there using the join and have that column be placed after the ship ID. All right, try this on your own. Come back here and we'll see how you did. 
In the last exercise, we asked you to execute the join clause. We're joining two tables. We're joining orders and shippers. And we want to look at the company name of the shipping vendor in the orders table result. All right, so let's walk through this. First of all, I want to make sure that I don't get any duplicate records. So I'm going to make sure that I know how many rows are in my orders table. And to do that, I'm just going to run a quick select all from orders. And I'm sure you've noticed throughout this program, if I highlight part of a SQL statement in a query editor, it will just execute what you highlight. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just making sure that I get the number of rows in my orders table. Before I join anything else, I get 830 rows. Okay, great. I know that's the number I want to make sure I stay at after I join my information. So going back to my result set, here's what I have. I have two tables. I have orders. I've given it the alias O and I have shippers. I've given it the alias S and I'm joining O's, O's. I'm joining orders with shippers where my order ship via column equals my shippers ID column in my shippers table. So they don't have to be the same name. That's fine. You can just say match this to this. There are different names in both of these tables. That's not a problem. If I execute this, I still get 830 rows. Perfect. I know I don't have any duplicates. And if I look over here, I see my vendor ID and I see my company name right next to it. All right, in this exercise, we looked at joins. We did an inner join where you can get the exact number of records between two tables. We talked about left join and right join where you can clarify what your source table is to make sure you get all of the records in that table regardless of if it finds a match or not. In our next exercise, we're going to start to look at putting queries together. So in addition to joining tables, you can have two separate queries display in one result set. And you can also get records that are the exception to the queries that you're asking for data on. So we'll talk about both of those options. We'll walk through some examples. So meet me in the lesson in the next lesson and we'll keep learning. In this exercise, we're going to look at putting two queries together. Okay. So in addition to joining, there's other ways that you can combine tables of information. One is called union, and there is two sets of that function. There's union and union all. And the difference between these two is union is going to give you the combined result set based on unique values. So you won't see any duplicates that are in any table and union all will give you all of the values that you're asking for, even if there are duplicates. And we'll walk through the, both of those examples. All right. So I'm taking two tables here. Okay. I'm going to work with my customer's table and my supplier's table. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to join together or link together these two columns, city and country. Now, logically you want to make sure that you're putting together columns of the same information, the function will let you pick any two columns from any two tables. So you could pick two columns or two tables and not pick like columns in each of those tables. It will work, but you really won't get a very intuitive result set because your column headers won't accurately show all the information that's in both tables underneath. So you just want to make sure that you're putting together the same columns in the tables that you're including in your union. So in this example, we're using customers and suppliers, and I'm looking at the city and the country of my customers with the city and the country of my suppliers. So let's look at the individual results first. If I just run this select statement, I look in here, I see all the cities that I have customers in for the country of USA. Now in here, you see each of these cities. Let me order this by city so you can see this a little more clearly. You see your list here and you see you actually have two customers in Portland. So Portland USA shows twice in this result. Now for suppliers, Let's look at those. Okay, I have four cities in my suppliers results. I have New Orleans, Ann Arbor, Bend, and Boston. So there's two ways you can put this information together. If I just say union, give me 
my cities of my suppliers and my cities of my customers. And I run this, I get 16 records. And I see each unique city that are in USA for both my suppliers and my customers. Now, if I said union all, and I ran this again, I see 17 records as a result. And that's because it did not combine the duplicate customers in Portland from my customer's table. So the difference between union and union all is whether you want to just see distinct values or if you want to see all values. Okay. So why don't you try this on your own? Why don't you try to show a union result of all of the orders that have a ship city against all of the customers that have a city both in the USA. All right, so pause this video, try that query on your own, come back here and we'll check it out. Okay, in the last exercise, we asked you to compare the ship city and country for the cities in USA with the city and country in suppliers from orders. All right, so let's look at this as two separate statements and then combine them together in a union. So starting off with the city and the country from the orders table, I identified my columns that are in the orders table and I made sure I still have my work clause in here to include just the ship country for USA. Let's execute that and see what we get. All right, we get 122 rows. So I'm going to make note of that. And I see all of my records listed here. I don't have an order by city on this clause, but I can see straight off the bat, there's a lot of duplicates. I have a lot of Albuquerque's here, a lot of Portland's, all right? So I know these are not unique values. That's fine. Going to go into my suppliers country again, just to refresh my memory and what's in here. I only have four cities. Okay, great. So I have 122 and I have four. If I add that together, that's 126. So let's start with just union. All right. So if all I used was the union clause to put these two together, when I ran this combined statement, all I get is 16 because these are my combined unique values. So I only have cities in orders that are also in cities in suppliers. Okay. Now, if I put my all clause in here with union and I ran this, I see 126 and that's everything. This is each individual city for all of my orders in USA and my cities in my suppliers, okay? So that's the difference between union and union all. In this exercise, we covered how to combine tables with a clause other than join to show either distinct values or accumulated values between both tables. In our next example, we're going to show how to see results that are not included in a query using the accept clause. All right, a simple example here of the accept clause will show you how to find results from one table except for the results that are also in the second table. So let me show you how this works. We're going to stick with our orders table and our suppliers table in this example. And first I'm going to show you all of the orders that are in the table from USA with the city. So we see here we have 12 results. So we have Albuquerque all the way through down to Walla Walla. I'm going to bring your attention to Boise number three, because that's going to be the exception to the rule in our accept results set. And what that means is that what's going to happen is once I run this and I say, give me all the results in orders, except for the results that are also in suppliers, we're only going to see 11 results. Boise will not show because that's also a city in our country's table. So if I run suppliers, you're going to see here, we now have five. I actually made an edit to the table to put Boise in here to show this example. I have five cities in all my suppliers. So what the accept clause is going to do is say, give me all of the ship cities and ship countries in orders, 
except for the cities that are in suppliers. So I should see only 11 results because Boise is the column that's in suppliers that I'm eliminating from my orders. So if I run this and show my results, I only see 11. Boise is not in here because it is also found in suppliers and I'm asking for everything in orders that is not in suppliers. Okay, let's talk some more about subqueries. So we've seen a little bit of this in some of our prior examples. We did some of this when we were looking at Pivot and you've seen us join two tables together. Now what you can do is make a series of separate queries to put together in an overall query to get specific columns from specific tables. And this becomes really powerful when you have a lot of data in many different tables and you only need a few columns from each. So we're just gonna use two tables in here as an example to show you how this works. It's very simple to set up and you'll find yourself using this a lot in your querying skills as well. So what we're gonna work with here are the customers table and the orders table, all right? So let's start with looking at the individual result sets. So if I pull up my information in customers, I can see what I have here, 91 rows, has basic customer information. Now in here, all I'm looking for are my customer IDs and my employee IDs from my orders table. All right, let's pull those up here. So here's what we get here. Okay, we got that. Got about 830 rows there. Now, what I'm asking for here is give me all of my customers that are assigned to employee number eight, okay? So employee number eight is a salesman. I wanna know what customers this employee has. So I'm gonna do that by putting the information from these two tables together. And I'm gonna do that by specifying each one of these table results as a subquery against my overall query that I'm gonna be pulling the columns from. All right, so the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna set up your queries for what you want. And let's just say I want all these columns from my customer table and I want just these two columns from my orders table where my employee ID equals eight. All right, perfect, that's what I want. Now, every query that you have as a subquery, once again, you have to reference as an alias. And again, you can call it whatever you want. You can call this cat, you can call this dog, you can call this cat dog. It does not matter what you call it. It will pick up whatever you tell it to pick up. But to be intuitive and to make sure our coding is intelligent, you wanna always try and reference something that someone else who reads your code could figure it out. So in this example, I always use the first letter of each table for me, it makes it easy, the first letter or first two letters, I always know exactly where that information is coming from. So in here, we have customers equals C. And uh, for my orders query, I actually use an E here because I'm pulling in the employees from the orders. So you could use that logic as well. To be consistent, we could change this to an O so that we know that we're pulling in from our orders table and we have stability in our alias referencing. All right, so here's my columns from my customer table. Here's my columns from my orders table from employee ID for ID. And I'm going to keep this real simple. I'm going to take all of my columns from customers and all of my columns from my subquery for orders. Now, what's interesting here, you'll see I'm using the wildcard character to get all my columns, but I'm only going to get the columns that I have referenced in my query. So even though the orders table has many more columns than just this um, customer and employee, I'm only going to get what I'm saying in my subquery when you reference that information from your top select. So I have everything from customers, everything from my orders. I have my alias. I have a comma in between my two statements and both of my statements are enclosed in parentheses. That's your syntax, okay? Now outside of that, so outside of your subqueries, you're going to include your join. So same rules apply as when you're doing a join, you need to reference what the link is between your subquery tables. And in, in, in this example, I have customer ID in both. So I'm linking my customer ID 
to my orders customer ID. And the equal sign just means an inner join. Okay. We could also say join and do our left, do our right. We could, we could still use that same functionality here as well, but we're going to keep this simple just to show sub queries. So I have my underlying queries referenced in enclosed parentheses. I have each of them having a alias that I can reference to pull my columns from. So let's start here to pull everything and then we'll see what we get. All right, so this looks good. So I have 104 rows. I know that's how many, that's how many records were in my employee table. So that makes sense. All of these customers belong to employee number eight. Okay. So these are all the customers that he has. And we can see here, if we dig into it a little bit more, it looks like we have some duplicate records, right? So what's going on there? I mean, how can we have the same thing over and over? I could fix this a few ways. I could say group by and group by all of my columns here from my top and list those all out here. I'm gonna group by clause. But before I do that, I wanna make sure I look in here and see how come I have this result set. So there's a little bit of troubleshooting you can do with these subqueries as well. So let's look and see how come we have duplicate information. So let me look at my orders table and I'm just gonna take a shortcut and put select all in here from my orders where my employee IDs equal eight. Let's see what happens. Hmm. All right. And let me order this by customer ID because I see duplicates, but I still don't have all my details. Okay. Okay, so here's what I see is going on. This makes total sense. Customers have more than one order, okay? Makes perfect sense. I know exactly what's going on here. Here's the reason why I have duplicates, that's great. So in order to streamline my result set, I can do one of two things. I can either include order ID in my orders table, which might not be a bad idea because it's gonna clearly show how come I see the same thing over and over again. And I have an error message here because I forgot to take out some additional referencing that I was using when I was doing my troubleshooting. And now this makes more sense, okay? I have duplicate records, but I can see why. I have order IDs over here. I would actually make this look better and I would put my order columns first and then I would put my customer columns. And then I run that. Here we go. This looks accurate. This makes total sense. If I didn't want my order ID in here, again, I could group by everything. So I could say group by in here and list all of these columns and see what happens there. All right, if I do that, what's going on? Well, I kind of still have duplicate records. So why is that happening? The reason why that's happening is because you've grouped on your subquery, not your overall query. So to eliminate duplicate records in a subquery result, you need to make sure that you do that aggregate at the end so that the values from both source queries are grouped together. Now, when that happens, you need to make sure again that you put your proper table referencing in here. And in the group by clause, you have to actually specify your individual columns. You can't just use the wildcard characters. So what we would have to do is specify the customer ID from both C for customers and O for orders. And then we're also going to have to include in any other columns from the orders table that aren't in the customers table. So we don't have to put a unique identifier in front of those because all of these columns are unique. Okay. So orders does not have company name, contact name, or anything like this. And likewise, customers does not have employee ID. Okay. Now to show you what that means, if I just put customer ID in here and I didn't enter my my table alias, I'm gonna get an error message. And it's gonna tell me I have an ambiguous column name because it doesn't know where to pull this customer ID from. Or do you want it from orders or do you want it from customers? So I gotta tell it. I wanna make sure I put it in both spots because it needs it in both spots so that you have both table references. 
And then if I run this, oh, there we go. Beautiful, 56 rows, everything is pulled together, it's aggregated, it's summarized, it's unique values, this is exactly what I want. And I know how many customers my employee ID number eight has. All right, so why don't you try this on your own? Using the order details table, I want to know which orders were shipped to Brazil, okay? So you need to use two tables in your subquery. Your first table is going to be your order details, and your second table is going to be your orders. And you're going to pull in the ship country column from the orders table into the query result that includes the order details columns, and you're going to join both tables by order ID. And you need to make sure that you include the where clause on your order subquery where ship country equals Brazil. All right, try that on your own, see how far you get, come back here, check out your results, and we'll take it from there. Okay, in the last exercise, you were asked to find all the orders that were shipped to Brazil. To do that, we're using two tables. We're using order details and orders. So let's just first look at our subquery results. Order details, I have order ID, product ID, and order total that I've called the unit price column, quantity and discount. If I look at the orders table and I wanna know what's gone to just Brazil, I have my order ID and my ship country here, excellent. All right, so let's combine this information. So I have my first query enclosed in parentheses and I've given it the alias OD for order details. I have my second query enclosed in parentheses and I've given it the alias OB for orders in Brazil. Order ID is my common column between the two tables. I have that referenced as my where clause. And all I want is the ship country column from my orders table. So I'm not going to get everything. I replaced my wildcard character with just that column, but I am going to still take all of the columns from order details. So let's run this result set. Here's what we get. Excellent. I have all of my columns from my order details and I see which ones have been shipped to Brazil. All right. So in this lesson, we learned about subqueries, how to reference them and execute the proper syntax using parentheses and aliases, and how to pick up the columns that you need in your top query results. Also showing how you can troubleshoot information if you see duplicate records and group by so that you can make sure you're only showing unique values. Now in our next lessons, we'll just cover how to export data. So the information is displayed great in your SQL database, but you need to export this information to share with your user community. So we'll walk through how to do that in Excel and a text file so that you can do more information with those results and send it to your user community. So let's talk about exporting data. So you're able to do whatever you need to in your SQL database tool or whatever tool you're using to create your queries from. You know how to get your results sets, but now you have to get these results to your user community. Now your user community doesn't have SQL Server, right? They don't have an editor, they can't do what you do. So they need the results exported to them. Now, depending on what tool you're using, there's a few different ways that you can make this happen. In this exercise, we're going to use the tools that we have, and I'm going to show you how to very simply get the data out of SQL Server into a file. If you're using something different than SQL Server, your commands or your menu options may vary from what we're going to look at here. There are also SQL coding functions that you can use to actually code the export of a data set. So you can enter in, for example, your server name, your database name, your username and your password, and then your path to your file name and execute that code to get an export also. In this result, we're gonna keep it simple. We're just gonna show what we can do in this interface and create a very easy export for your users. So let's start off with the orders table. There's two ways you can really go about doing this. You can either highlight all of the rows that are in your result set. And this works when you have a small result set. I mean, 830 rows is really a very small result set. On some queries, they're very large. And obviously, copying and pasting is not an option to export results. But for something small like this, we could do that. And we can just right click and we're going to say copy with headers. And we're going to open up what we want to put this in. More than likely for you, it's Excel or a spreadsheet tool like this. We're going to highlight everything and we're just going to say Control V. We're going to get a message that 
things aren't the same size where we're coming from and where we're going to. That's fine. I'm going to say, okay, I pop it in here and I have my basic information. All right. Now there's some work I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to do some of my formatting skills in Excel to get this data to display the way that I wanted to. But I have all of the values that were from my result set, which is exactly what I need. Okay. Excellent. That's option one. Option two is you can just right click on here in your results set and say, save results at what you're going to get here is a series of locations that you can say you want to download to. You can pick your location. In this case, I'm just going to put it in my documents folder. I'm going to give it a name and it's going to default to CSV. I could also select a different type. If I want this to be a text file, I can select TXT and save it from there. So now my file is saved. I'm going to open it up my export file, take a look at it. There it is. There's all my results. This is great. This is raw data. Again, I can load this into any application that I want to manipulate that result set and send it to my user community. That concludes our program on SQL querying fundamentals. Thank you very much for taking this course with us. You learned a lot here. We learned how to connect to a SQL database, query a database, use conditions, use wildcard values, perform date calculations. We learned about summarizing data with aggregate functions. We learned how to sort our data, group our data, rank our data, and filter our data. We also learned how to join multiple tables. We learned how to put two queries together, look at results that were in one query and not another query. We had an introduction to subqueries and we learned how to export data as well. We hope you enjoyed this course here at Learn It. Thank you very much for taking it with us and have a great day. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit LearnIt.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing LearnIt.